There is something extremely exhilarating about the beginning of any great adventure. And yet that adventure cannot be approached without great respect and a certain awe. The mountains to climb, the miles and the hours and the days that stretch ahead, slowly dissolving into what will soon seem to be an eternity. All the months of training and preparation work peak in the mighty sustained efforts of two men and their nine member support crew, ultra challenging their minds and bodies, their equipment, and their ability to work as a team, as one mind focused on the task of crossing the continent in the fastest, solely human-powered time in history. Lon Haldeman, age 28, is a two-time winner of the race across America. He and his wife, Susan Notarangelo, held the previous tandem record set in 1986 of nine days, 20 hours. Pete Pensiers, age 44, is also a two-time winner of the race across America. He holds the record with his Ram 86 winning time of 8 days, 9 hours, 47 minutes. Pete was on the team in 1979 that first established a transcontinental tandem record. Lon and Pete were as experienced as veterans of the grueling Ram could be. Well aware of the challenge and well suited to rise to it. To train, to discipline, to concentrate, and to endure the 3,000 miles from Huntington Beach, California to Atlantic City, New Jersey through some of the most adverse conditions that either of them had ever faced. You want to stretch beyond what you, you think you can do and, uh, and then just try and figure out ways to, to make it happen. And so when Lon and I started talking about this, this tandem transcontinental, we, we had the idea that, that it could be done in a week, but we didn't really know at that time how we were going to do it. So then there was a lot of work ahead of, of us to decide, okay, now we've said we can do this, and yet neither one of us have ever done this before, so we've got to go faster than we've ever done in our previous transcontinentals. How are we going to make this happen? It's an extrapolation from what we've done before. It's, uh, it's new, and uh, we can't go to anybody else and ask them because it just hasn't happened yet. But we've, uh, we've taken the experiences that we've, we've gained, each one of us. We've shared them. It's a team effort, and uh, we're taking that and, and a lot of new ideas. Uh, and we're going to build on those and, and just put it all together and make it happen. They started by developing a training strategy to build the two essential ingredients of winning, speed and endurance. To build up their speed, they trained with each other, with small groups and with packs of riders to develop short-term bursts of speed. This increased their maximum oxygen intake until they could ride consistently one and two miles per hour faster than they had ridden earlier in the season. Then, they concentrated on endurance. You need to be able to ride 400 miles a day, so we're going to build to that, uh, to that 400 miles in one 24-hour period, and we're going to repeat that once a week and as a building block. And then at the end of, of a, a six-week period, we're going to be able to do that a lot easier than we did at the beginning. And then we're going to do seven of those simul one, one day at a time, uh, but put them together. Pete and I are uh, difference in body size, but yet our uh, styles are somewhat similar. So it was fairly easy for us to adapt. And if we're going to be able to survive on the third and fourth day, uh, we're both going to have to uh, be feeling strong and uh, not fight each other on the hills. And uh, that's, that's another important aspect of training, is getting used to being on the tandem uh, and being comfortable. Uh, some, in some ways, a tandem is, is more difficult to be comfortable on than a single bike, and so we've had to overcome that uh, using uh, the arm supports, uh, better uh, frame uh, tubing materials, uh, just to, to, to make the, the bike uh, better to stay on you know, for 21 hours a day. By May 7, 1987, Lon and Pete were going through the final phase of their pre-race tests. The EKGs confirmed their readiness. Both felt that they were in the best condition of their lives. Oxygen consumption and overall strength were measured out on high-tech equipment at SCORE, Human Performance Center. This medical team, a doctor and three physical therapists, would also accompany Lon and Pete across the country to monitor their performance and to research the upward limits of human capabilities. He just set the record for this lab for VO2 max, which is 87.4. Let's say it was. 87.4, and 
Lon just set the record for the most work output, which was uh, about 500 watts, which is a phenomenal amount of output considering basically 750 watts is one horsepower. Lon himself is about good for two thirds of a horsepower. Yeah, Pete's horsepower, and you got well over one and one and two tenths, one and three tenths horsepower. So they're going to be very fast on this attempt. Psychologist, ultramarathonist Michael Shermer, himself a four-time Ram contender, administered the eight-state questionnaire. Lon and Pete would take this psychological test again once they completed the race. And Michael hoped it would give him interesting information on the impact of sleep deprivation, exhaustion, and extreme stress levels on human emotional states. Right now, they're they're as high and strong and and and, uh, and steady as can be and then eight days later after they've gone through 3,107 miles of, of virtual physical torture what kind of emotional state are they in? Nothing like this has ever been done in the history of endurance sports and uh, there's been a lot of physiological testing which is important but I think this is an element that, that hasn't been measured that we need to look at. Two days before the ride their emotional states couldn't have been much higher. They had taken every measure they could think of to increase their all-around efficiency and to cut down on wind resistance. These final hours were not without some anxiety, however. Two days before, it had become apparent that one of the bicycles would need to be modified and it was shipped off immediately. Raleigh Cycle Company's response was swift and by late afternoon May 8th, 12 hours before the event, the bike was back and being assembled by the crew. Their tandems were custom-built prototypes by Raleigh. Lightweight, aluminum tubing by Easton, covered by a carbon fiber wrap, and then coated with Kevlar for protection and added strength. The bikes were lightweight, 38 pounds, yet strong and resilient. Comfortable to ride, yet stiff enough to prevent side-to-side -side sway. Disc wheels perfected by Steve Head would reduce the wind resistance normally associated with spokes. Crosswinds would prevent their use, but otherwise they were expected to add another one or two miles per hour to their speed. The smooth, treadless Avocet tires were designed for high performance. These tires can be pressurized to as high as 140 pounds per square inch to further reduce rolling resistance. Avocet cyclometers were installed on both front and rear. They were equipped with lights so that Lon and Pete could monitor their speed at night after they had lost the daytime visual stimulation necessary to maintain their pace. Union lighting supplied the lights for the bikes for added safety and visibility and also to make the bikes legal on the road. One of the newest innovations, hydraulic brakes designed by Bill Mathauser, gave them greater stopping power. Now they could make their downhill runs faster and with more confidence. The saddle in a multi-day event like this is critical. Pete prefers the Avocet Gel Flex saddle and Lon, his Brooks leather saddle, adequately broken in, gives him enough cushion to stay on the bike 22 hours a day. An independent rear stem assembly by Merlin Metal Works would allow them to change their handlebars quickly to the arm supports. Shimano BioPace gearing with three chain rings in the front, associated with seven cogs in the back, gave them a 21-speed bicycle. A special cleat on the bottom of the shoe clips around the Aerolite pedal, minimizing weight while giving a high degree of efficiency while pedaling. The Shimano SIS system derailleurs have a distinct click for each gear, preventing the riders from ever missing a shift and always keeping the gears in total alignment. The alloy rims are by Mistral. On the non-disc wheels, they would use 36 spoke rims weighing 300 to 350 grams. Ultra Energy, a liquid food originally developed for Pete on Ram 86, is, as Pete calls it, high performance, super unleaded fuel. It is a complete food consisting mostly of carbohydrates, but also including protein in the form of basic amino acids, as well as the essential fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals. Suspension eyewear provided their glasses uniquely designed to stay in place without putting pressure on the nose or ears. Their clothing, by pace, needed to be both comfortable and aerodynamic. The Lycra shorts were designed with sufficient padding through the crotch area to prevent skin irritation. Their Kinco gloves were made from breathable, porous pigskin leather and had stretchable Lycra backs for comfort over the long hours of use. The crew is vitally important to us, especially on a trip like this. Um, it's they keep us on the bike. They, they can really improve our time by uh, minimizing every stop that we have to make. They can help us change our clothes, that when we have bike trouble, when we have a flat tire, they can do quick, uh, quick changes of the, the tires and wheels. They do everything for us except ride our bikes. 
the other thing they do is, is just the emotional support. It's, it's really important for us to have people with us that know us very well and really care for us, that they have the same goal in mind. And, uh, and it helps to have family members uh, or really good close friends. Lon and Pete combined their crews from previous years and created a nine-member team of experts and transcontinental veterans they knew they could count on. Pete's team included Joanne Penn Sears, the crew director and Pete's wife of 22 years. She was a seasoned veteran of five previous transcontinentals. Susie Short, massage therapist, has accompanied Pete every year since 1983 with her magic hands. Penny Penn Sears is Pete's mother and a registered nurse who will take care of any medical problems that arise on the trip with the riders or with the crew. She's a four-year veteran of Ram Transcontinentals. Ross Sturdivant, photographer. This would be his first trip as a crew member, but Ross has been on the ABC film crew every year for coverage of the race across America. In Lon's camp were John Royer, chief mechanic on Lon's crew since 1981, the year of the double transcontinental. John is also an expert auto mechanic, a vital importance on an event like this as there is more chance of mechanical problems with the vehicles than there is with the bikes. John is himself an accomplished ultramarathonist, having raced in the 1985 race across America. Mike Brogan, driver, mechanic, and all-around hard worker, a veteran of three transcontinentals. Phil Cole, first transcontinental last year, expert mechanic, expert driver, who will also help in clothing changes and rubdowns. Wayne Platting, PR media relations contact person and the official for this event. Wayne has been seriously involved with long distance cycling for the past two years and has his eyes set on Ram 88. This would be his first transcontinental and Wayne held the honorable distinction of being the only rookie on the team. Bindi Beck first met Juan in 1984. He noted her talents and encouraged her to become more involved as an ultramarathonist. Bindi crewed in Ram 86 for Elaine Muriel, the top woman contender. Lon's brother Ken would join the crew later on in Indiana, along with Magali, a law student from Loyola. Each person on the team exemplified the essential qualities of a top-notch crew member. Enthusiastic, energetic, and always an unswerving willing ability to go above and beyond the call of duty. Spirits were high and confident on the eve of this tandem record attempt as the crew assembled in Huntington Beach for one last full course meal at the Red Onion and one last night in real beds at the Huntington Beach Inn. But 6 a.m. was to come soon enough, May 9th, 1987. Fellow bicyclists and supporters had gathered in front of the two-wheeled transit authority to wish them well and, for some, to ride for a while with Lon and Pete as they launched their incredible journey. Leaving Huntington Beach, they turned eastward on a route that would take them through Flagstaff, Albuquerque, Wichita, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Dayton, Lancaster, and finally, nearly 3,000 miles later, and hopefully before 6 a.m. on May 17th, they would arrive on the boardwalk in front of the Golden Nugget Casino, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Much of this route was established by Ram pioneer John Marino. Lon and Pete both were into this back in the late 70s. I remember when uh, I did set my 1978 record, I met Pete for the first time in 79. 
and he came to visit me in Costa Mesa eating his bag of M&Ms and preparing for his tandem crossing and he was pretty much learning how to do it. And I think Pete is just one of these people that has inherent strength in long distance and this is uh, revealed in his ability and Lon is another person that has inherent strength, very strong. It's changed dramatically. I, I can remember back in 78 when I did it. Uh, I was told at the time that you had to get eight hours sleep, and it seemed reasonable because anybody that would ride all day had to get eight hours sleep. And, and I went and I think I slept five or four hours, and that at the time was believed to be unheard of. And I remember I went through a, a stress test at the UCLA Medical Center, and they thought that I was some sort of a superman. And I disappointed everybody because I wasn't. I was just a regular person. And so since the Race Across America started, uh, and it, it opened up the event to competition and brought in the best athletes. Uh, it's incredible what's happening. Technology is taking over. You're getting pe people like Pete and Lon that are uh, uh, using scientific uh, training methods, uh, testing their bodies, uh, the liquid diet, the technology with the bicycles. And that's why the times are, are remarkable. You know, the eight-day crossing uh, if you would have asked me about an eight-day crossing back in 78, I would have said that's just impossible. It took you how long? It took me 13 days in 78, then 12 days in, in 1980. And uh, I still would have thought that, that eight days would have been impossible. But it's uh, possibly these, these two will do it uh, in less than eight and seven. Leaving the West Coast behind, Lon and Pete forged on ahead. Alone now, except for two riders, one of whom was Rob Templin. Pete's 1979 tandem partner. Rob would ride with them to the Arizona border with his girlfriend as a one-woman support crew. Pete and I have been riding a tandem together for a long time, and this was, I think, his opportunity to, <clears throat> to uh, set a pretty impressive record with Lon. Because Lon's done pretty well, obviously, on cross-country record attempts. I think they're going to do real well. Pete and Lon had been facing headwinds most of the morning, but they expected to find tailwinds after their long climb through Lamb Canyon. Little did they know then just how elusive and rare those favorable winds would be for them across the vast country that lay ahead. Near Palm Springs, they turned from their route along Interstate 10 and headed north and east on Route 62 toward Morongo Valley and Joshua Tree. 29 palms in the Sheephole Mountains to eventually link up with Interstate 40, which would take them all the way to Tucumcari, New Mexico. Near Amboy, across dry Bristol Lake, the medical team set up to run their first series of tests. Very shortly we'll be having these masks put on their face. They'll breathe into this, we'll hook this hose up to them and record about a half an hour's worth of data on each rider. We'll do that probably two or three times a day, each day for the next seven or so days. Good. A little far, Larry. A little far. Okay. Not, not, not that one, the one underneath the chin. Yeah, there you go. Slide it all the way up. Pull forward, Larry. Good. Good. We're in business. as on a day-by-day -day basis in this Trans-America attempt, how much energy do they expand? And secondly, we can also, from the combination of oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide measurements, determine how much uh, or what proportion of fats and carbohydrates they're using as a source of energy. That, in turn, is going to give us very useful information about the proper type of nutrient intake they should be taking in as the day as the event goes on. Today. 
By early evening, they had merged with I-40. They had made good time in spite of the wind, but ahead they would be facing a long, cold, and sleepless night. Their plan was to go this first 48 hours of their trip without sleep, and hopefully they would be somewhere close to Albuquerque before they took a break. They were near Ash Fork, Arizona, 427 miles from Huntington Beach. Nice. Good morning. Sweet. Yeah. Kind of steel. Tell us all about it. It felt wonderful. <laughs> Seven days, you're going to get a lot of this. Good. Dr. Robert Breedlove from the medical team got out and rode alongside while the rest of the team prepared to greet Lon and Pete's morning with more tests. Right now we're, we're getting along real well. The time, we haven't had any tailwinds, so just playing horse powering it, we're about an hour and a half ahead of the schedule. So getting into Flagstaff, so we're real happy with that. It was still early in the morning of day two when the mountains and the forests of northwestern Arizona gave way to the wide open sky of the high desert land. With its thunderstorms and finally a little tailwind. Lon and Pete's daily food requirement was incredible. The liquid ultra-energy diet was sustaining them, and they had each consumed about 30 bottles so far. But by this time, late afternoon of day two, it was time for a little change in the menu. Pete wants a grilled cheese sandwich with Munster cheese, and uh, Lon wants some chicken noodle soup with just a few crackers in it. He doesn't want it like he needs it, just a few. And Lon wants the chicken noodle soup in one of those big tall styrofoam cups and he wants the noodles cut up a little bit so he can drink it out of the cup and they, and they want to have that now I think. The crew in the motor home who were pulling kitchen duty cooked up this special order gourmet meal to go. To be exact Pete's average intake was 8,170 calories per day and Lon's was 11,300. In the end, approximately 95% of their calories would come from the liquid diet and the ultra-energy cookies. This was supplemented only by some soup and crackers and some sandwiches, the total of which would have made about one normal meal. Trucks are a factor that always need to be reckoned with. These professionals also have rigorous schedules to keep, so it's extremely important to cooperate and communicate as much as possible. The vehicles were kept well-spaced and off the road whenever possible leapfrogging the riders every five to ten miles. Yeah. 
police escort awaited them that night in Gallup, New Mexico, and gave them a little boost in facing the long, dark road to Albuquerque. Hey, they know how to make you feel important in this town. They've arranged a fantastic thunderstorm for us. As they left Gallup, they passed a grim reminder of the hazards of being on the road. making uh, plans with the crew, you know, what we're going to do when we go down for the sleep breaks and everything. Both of us feel pretty wide awake now, but if we, if we don't get back into a sleep pattern, you know, we skip the sleep break now, uh, you know, we really can't, we don't want to get in a pattern of taking a sleep break in the middle of the afternoon. So, you know, we're going to try to get back on the schedule now where we're sleeping, you know, possibly from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock every morning. Procedure once we get in the motorhome is take a take a sponge bath, you know, get 800 miles of dirt off of us, and uh, 